For 175 years, God has given life to this organization. He has called us to go. Thousands have answered that call, and Southern Baptists have joined together to send them. From every walk of life, from every part of our country, they boarded ships and planes, leaving behind all that was comfortable, predictable, safe and secure. All to go and share the good news of Jesus Christ. Into deserts and jungles, across mountains and seas, they planted their lives preaching Christ crucified. Many completed their service and came back to their homeland, but some did not. Some would perish on the field. They would starve, become ill, or be struck down on distant and dangerous roads to present the gospel. And some would be struck down for simply preaching the good news of Christ. In moments of extreme violence, many would choose to stay in danger to bring peace to those in the midst of chaos. Those are dark days for all of us, when we lose our brothers and sisters, when we feel the very real sting of death. On those days, we all ask, is it worth it? Is it worth the high price, the ultimate price? Etched on the hearts of missionaries throughout time are words like these. My life is of no value. My aim is to finish the race. To live is Christ and to die is gain. So we take up our cross to be living sacrifices. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. These lives were not lost. These lives were given. We may never know the full impact these missionaries have given on this side of eternity, but some stories we do know. Stories of God pouring out His Spirit on tribes and nations because missionaries modeled the one true sacrifice. Generations forever altered. Life is a gift. How will you Use the life you've been given. After surviving the, the virus, uh, I had a really, really great beard that I grew while I was off of work. It wasn't that great, <laughs> but I do have the remnants that they'll, they'll let me have it work. I'm still hanging on to it until she makes me shave it. Uh, <clears throat> we're, uh, we, we can, in, in a day like today, when, when we're, we're burying my aunt and uncle today uh, because of this terrible virus, uh, we can still smile because we have joy. In the middle of chaos, when our, our healthcare workers at the hospitals and us in the fire and EMS are, are worn to a frazzle, and it's, it, it's really, we, we've got depression and things like that going wild. 
we can still smile because we have joy. Uh, and, you know, we just, with the unknowns coming from our political leaders and even the ones that's supposed to know, we, we don't know what's what right now, but we can still smile because we have joy because our Lord Jesus. So we, I don't like wearing the mask, but I wear the mask because we don't know what's, what's what right now. And even behind that mask, I can smile because of the joy that comes from my Lord Jesus. I was telling Brother JJ this morning, was talking on the way to church this morning, about <clears throat> life seems like it's a big fog right now. And I still got some of that brain fog from that darn virus. But I don't know how people deal with the chaos of the world today without that joy. And so I'm just, I'm thankful for this church. We, we felt the prayers for us. We feel the prayers for our family as we buried Duck and Helen today. And uh, uh, we just, we were so thankful to be a part <clears throat> of a church that loves and supports each other like we do and that lifts up our Lord Jesus and we can have that joy. So as you can tell, the theme for today is joy. And uh, uh, Tammy's going to uh, read a verse. I'm going to light these candles and then we're going to pray. Psalms 30 and 5 says, His anger is but for a moment. His favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. Amen. Let me light these candles. Let us pray. Father, we just thank you so much for, first of all, who you are. Lord, that through all through the ages, Lord, that we st study history and we see there's chaotic times all through there. There was one that one constant, like Billy J.J. said this morning, that one constant is you. Lord, that you created us. And Lord, that we know because there's proof of it that you love us more than we can love ourselves. And because of that, Lord, we have the joy. God, with heavy hearts today, Lord, we, we, we lift up our entire family, Lord, as we go to lay Duck and Helen to rest today. Lord, I just pray you'd be with Sissy and, and the entire family, Lord, all the cousins, Lord, that are, that are mourning right now separately because of the situation we're in. Lord, we pray for our, our health care workers, our doctors, our nurses, Lord, our firefighters, our EMTs, Lord, that right now are just on the front lines and are being bombarded with stress like, like I haven't seen in my lifetime. Lord, we, we thank you. We thank you for church. We thank you for the church family. Lord, that lifts, we lift each other up. And Lord, we know that on those times when the, the world gets really heavy, Lord, we, we have people we can reach out to. We can call. We can pray over the phone. We can talk. We can love each other. And because of all that, Lord, we celebrate the joy that only comes from you. God, we pray for, for J.J. and his family and this, uh, the church leaders here and the entire church body, God, that you would continue, Lord, to put your hand on us, Lord, that we would be the, the hands and feet out there reaching out, even in these times, Lord, to love people and to love you. God, we thank you. Lord, we praise you. We pray that our church and each of our lives are glorifying to you in some way as we celebrate this season and we celebrate the joy that comes from you. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Good morning. Okay. Some of y'all have a good morning. The others aren't. But let's all stand together and let's worship together. I'm so happy to be here again uh, to help out with praise and worship. But let's all help each other out. Let's all sing together today because we have a God who's worthy of our praise. Amen. Amen. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is. I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes. 
for your love this morning, that we can just raise a hallelujah to your name, and that words cannot describe how great is your love, God, but we can try. How it lifts us up when we're down, and how it holds us tight when we're in despair, God. Thank you so much for the love that you give. From the darkness I called your name. Into darkness, your mercy came. You called me out, lifted me up. How great is your love. You bore my weakness, you took my shame. Buried my burdens in fields of grace. You call me out, lifted me up. How great is your love. From the heights of heaven, you stepped down to earth. Innocent perfection gave your life for us and we are amazed. Yes, we stand in awe, for we have been 
Just the voice. How great, how great, how great is your love. How great, how great, how great is your love. How great, how great, how great is your love for us. Such great love that you express by sending your son to die for our sins. But before he could die, he had to be sent as a man, fully God, fully man, knowing what he had to do. Oh, holy night, the stars of life shine. Long lay 
so beautiful for everybody to sing together. And I believe in the, in the ability for everybody to sing together as a one unified voice to God. So on this next song, if you know it, please, at the top of your voice, not worried about the person to your left or to your right, just sing it to God.
right now, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for each person, each family represented here. I pray, Lord, for each one of our healths. We ask now, Lord, that you touch our families, Lord. We ask you to touch Don and Helen's family, Lord. They were our family as well. And, God, we ask now, Lord, a special peace on them. But we pray right now, Lord, that you, this offering that we're about to take up will be used for your glory and your honor. Thank you for loving us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let me say at this time our children are dismissed to go back to Children's Church this morning. Good to see you this morning. Hope everybody is doing well today. Amen? Amen. Everybody doing good. Let's thank Brother Blake for being with us again. So good to have Brother Blake with us. He does a great job. We are grateful for his uh, abilities God has given him, and we're thankful God uh, let him come be with us today. And uh, grateful to the church he serves at for sharing him with us. And uh, we, we hold no punches. We are trying our best to steal him. Amen? We're trying. We're trying, but y'all won't let us. Amen? No. But anyway, it's good to see you. Appreciate you being here, Blake. Also, uh, as Brother Todd mentioned a minute ago, uh, keep uh, Brother, D Brother Don and Helen's family in your prayers. Their service today is at 2 o'clock, so uh, at Good Hope, if you can be there, it's a graveside service. I know that would be a blessing to their heart. Uh, if you can't, that's okay. We understand. Just pray for them and uh, pray that God's grace will be with them. And finally, let me just share with you, um, Brother Justin, you'll notice he's not here. He is in quarantine. And... Uh, he is in quarantine today, so we wave at Brother Justin and say hello to him. And I will tell uh, everybody here, like I did the first service, I'm jealous of him because he only has to do 10 days. I had to do 14. Amen? So I'm a little mad about that, but we'll get over it. But anyway, you pray for Brother Justin and uh, his family. He's there, but uh, we look forward to him being back with us soon. But uh, uh, those of you that are here uh, that uh, were planning on being at a planning meeting for the trip, I think he sent out some messages uh, that will be a Zoom meeting today. So the meeting will still go on. It'll just be a little different today. All right. All those preliminaries out of the way, look with me in Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. If you remember last uh, week we were talking, uh, first half of chapter 5, we looked at the peace we gained from uh, being there with our Lord Jesus Christ, the peace that Jesus has achieved for us in, uh, in, in, in his sacrifice for us and the peace that has been made between us and God. So we celebrated that last week. That got us down to the first half of verse 5, and we'll come from the end of verse 5 on down to verse 11 today. So let me read that for us, and, uh, and we will uh, dive into our time of uh, worship around the Word today. So I'm going to begin reading at the end of verse 5, Brother uh, Alan, I, don't, I know I've sort of threw you a loop. That's not where I started in the first service, so if you, if you catch me on verse 6, that's fine. 
And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Verse 6, for while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by by the death of his Son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. This is the word of the Lord for us. May God bless the reading and the preaching of his word. Join me, let's pray. Father, we ask your spirit to be in our midst this Lord's day. God, I pray as we break apart this part of your word and try to learn and Father, just be ministered to in our soul and our spirit. I pray that you give the Holy Spirit uh, freedom to to roam and move about in and through the hearts of those present here in the service, those watching uh, via live stream. Pray that you would just speak to their hearts and draw us ever close to you and remind us of why it is indeed we can, even in the midst of crazy times, be joyful. Lead us and guide us and may the May, may God be glorified in all we say and do in Jesus' name. Amen. Joy in the life of a believer in Christ. That's what we're looking at today. I ran across a story that I want to share with you. And as I said earlier, I'll apologize for the length of it, but it definitely makes the point we're trying to get across today. This writer says this of a joyous person. It says, no man has more reason to be miserable than this one, yet no man was more joyful than this man. His first home was a palace. Servants were at his fingertips. The snap of his fingers changed the course of history. His name was known and loved. He had everything, wealth, power, and respect, and and then he had nothing. Students of, of of this event still ponder it. Historians stumble as they attempt to explain it. How could a king lose everything in an instant? One moment he was royalty, the next moment he was poverty. His bed became, at best, a borrowed pallet and usually the hard earth. He never owned even the most basic mode of transportation and was dependent upon handouts for his income. He was sometimes so hungry, he would eat raw grain or even pick fruit from a tree as he passed by. He knew what it was like like to be rained on, to be cold. He knew what it meant to have no home. His palace grounds had been spotless now. He was exposed to the filth of the world. He had even, uh, he had never, excuse me, known disease, but now he was surrounded by illness. In his kingdom, he had been reverenced. Now he was ridiculed. His neighbors tried to lynch him. Some called him a lunatic. His family even tried to confine him to their house. Those who didn't ridicule him tried to use him. They wanted favors. They wanted tricks. He was a novelty. They wanted uh, wanted to be seen with him, that is, until being seen with him was out of fashion. Then they wanted to kill him. He was accused of a crime he never committed. Witnesses were hired to lie. The jury was rigged. No lawyer was assigned to his defense. A judge swayed by politics handed down the death penalty. They killed him. He left as he came, penniless. He was buried in a borrowed grave. His funeral financed by compassionate friends. Though he once had everything, he died with nothing. He should have been miserable. He should have been bitter. He had every right to be a pot of boiling anger, but yet he wasn't. He was joyful. 
People followed him wherever he went. Children scampered after him. Crowds clamored to hear him. Why? Why would people want to be around a man like this? And the reason was he was joyful. He was joyful when he was poor. He was joyful when he was abandoned. He was joyful when he was betrayed. He was even joyful as he hung on a tool of torture with, ha- with hands pierced with six-inch Roman spikes. Who is this man, you ask? Jesus. Jesus. Jesus embodied a stubborn joy. Listen to that very closely. Jesus embodied a stubborn joy, a joy that refused to be bent in the winds of hard times, a joy that held its ground against pain, a joy whose roots extended deep into the bedrock of eternity. I want to remind you and try to call your heart and my heart to this fact today. What the world needs to see more than anything else right now is a stubborn joy in the life of a believer. Can I get an amen? They need to see that. We talked about people in our lives and and maybe in a bad way or a negative way or a negative respect, but we'll say, man, they are just stubborn. And I know none of you fit that bill here today. Amen? Wives, don't look, at, don't, don't look at your husbands. But we've known people that are that way. You cannot convince them else otherwise. You cannot sway their minds. You cannot sway them. Once they think something, believe something, they will go to their grave believing that. You cannot convince them. We would call them stubborn. Friends, what we need today is some stubborn joy. Stubborn joy that will not, will not change, will not falter. Though the world gives way, though the world crumbles, we need to see that stubborn joy in the life of believers. Joy, joy by definition. Joy by definition, a feeling of great pleasure, of happiness, rejoicing. How in the world do we do that in such a world we live in today? How do we do that? However, as we talked about last week, you'll remember we talked about peace and we studied last week in the Bible, peace, the Bible applies joy the same way. Joy is not subjective, but rather it is objective. Joy is the same way. We cannot respond in joy as the Bible instructs us or directs us to if we are focused on our surroundings or our situation. If we were to do that, if Jesus was to do that, as the list of things I read to you about the things he endured while he was on the earth, man, if he was to follow and, de- and decide how he's going to live his life and respond to, to life in the things he was dealt, there's no way he should have been joyful. How could he do that? It's because his joy was focused on something greater. Jesus remind, remained joyful in, so, in sometimes joyless situations because he was focused on the object of his heavenly Father and the joy that lay before him in heaven. Friends, I can't help but think as I was sharing with the early service and, and Blake and I were talking in between the services, I didn't really tell him what all I was going to preach on today. I didn't sort of give him the, 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 the skivvy or the down low on all of it was. He knew the theme, I guess, of joy. But friends, there couldn't have been a better music selection chosen to fit with exactly what we're going to talk about today. Because when you think about singing about God's love, does that not blow your mind? Friends, if it doesn't blow your mind, you hadn't met him. Because to think that you're loved by a God like that, so we sing about that. And then we sing about what a hope we have in Jesus. Though the grave may come, and it will, and we'll be at a graveside today, there's no victory over that grave. You know why? Because through Jesus, there's life. And there's victory. Friends, when we think about that, we cannot be joyful in a joyless place if we're focused on situations. If we're focused on those things around us, we must have an object, and that object must far surpass anything we see, hear, and know. And friends, I got good news for you. There's an object, and he's not a thing. He's not an it. He's a person. He's called Jesus Christ, and he is worthy. He is worthy. 
That's the same thing we see as Paul's writing here. But in your notes there, I want to bring you back as we looked at last week. We looked at a section of Philippians, but I want to do that today with you again because Paul illustrates for us, just like Jesus did uh, here in Philippians, that, that, uh, that, that joy is not around our situation. Paul, we find Paul in a prison cell. Paul, here, I, I, I'm in verse 12 of Philippians 1, I want you to know, brothers... That what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Now, what's happened to Paul is he's been arrested for the gospel's sake again. He's been rest, arrested for preaching and proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ again. But notice verse 12. I want you to know what's happened to me has served to advance the gospel. What, Paul? Have you lost your mind? How is so? Verse 13. So that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and the rest of my imprisonment is for Christ. You know what's amazing in Paul's life in Philippians as well as what we'll look at here in Romans in just a second? What's amazing is this. Paul, in being arrested, was put in a place of power and prominence that nobody else would ever get to talk to anybody there in those places about the gospel. Nobody would be invited to do that. It had to go this way. And the only way God could get somebody in front of these imperial guard, in front of the emperor that day, was for them to be arrested. And Paul said, I'm your man. I'm your man. And what he did was, when he got up in there, he didn't sit there and say, oh, I don't deserve to be here. How dare this happen to me? I was just doing good and all this. No, Paul said, you know what? Hey, it's okay. I'm here. Let me tell you about Jesus. And some of us need to take a lesson from that. Notice I said us. Because sometimes I get in that place and get to thinking, man, this is just, why is this happening? Why is this happening? Friends, sometimes, a lot of times, most of the time, if not every time, God orchestrates things in our lives and puts us in places. And there's so many times we might miss a chance to share the gospel because we're focused on the subject rather than the object. How could Paul do that? He was focused on Christ. I'm going to tell you about Jesus. He said, you know what's happening on the outside? There's some brothers who have become more confident. There's become some brothers, and I'm going to quickly go through this because I don't want to get bogged down here, and I'm afraid I will if I keep reading. But what's happening is there's some brothers that's become more confident because Paul's out of the picture, and Paul's in prison. He's not out preaching. So there's some brothers that felt a little bit inadequate around Paul and preaching in the midst of Paul. So God took Paul out so that God's word could still come through these vessels because God wanted to get glory through them. So they become confident in their preaching. But what's also happening is there's some enemies of the cross. There's some enemies of Paul, and there's some people wanting to add problems to Paul and add, add, add maybe days onto his sentence because they're going to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and hope to add pain to Paul. Paul says, ha, no big deal. He said, some are preaching from a pure heart. Those that are out there preaching because their confidence has been boosted because I'm in here. Some are preaching to add pain to me. He said, what am I going to do? Sit over here and pout? No. I said, I'm going to rejoice because the gospel's getting out. I'm going to rejoice because people are hearing the gospel, verse 18. Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Jesus is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. Paul knew there were some Baptists that need to hear that twice about rejoicing. Amen? In the letter to the Philippians, Paul's subject or surroundings was imprisonment. However, his object was Christ and the gospel. And friends, that is the only way you and I will make it in and through this troublesome time. Let me just let you in on a little secret. What we're experiencing now is a troublesome time, is a fretful time, and it is a, it is a difficult time. But I'm going to tell you what, if time permits and time goes on, we're going to face some more. We're going to face more. We're going to face more difficulties because as we said last week, the Bible teaches us that time and earth and man are not going to get better and better. They're going to get worse and worse and worse. And we see that happening in our day. It's going to get worse. How do we persevere through that? We must focus on Christ. And we must love him more than we love our surroundings. Paul here in this text reveals to us where joy builds from in the life of the believer. And buddy, I'm going to tell you what, buckle up because this is a good ride. Amen. This is a good ride. Number one, Paul reminds us that God's love for believers brings joy. 
Paul's love, or Paul reminds us God's love for believers brings joy. Look at the latter part of verse 5 as we read a moment ago, down to verse 8. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love is poured into our heart. God's love is poured. We'll talk about love a little more next week. I know this theme is joy, but friends, I'm going to tell you what. There's nothing that fires me up or makes me more joyful than to know this, that I am loved by God. Amen? That I am loved by the Holy One. The one that spoke the world into existence. Remember Paul's subjects. Remember who Paul's talking to. Look back with me in verse 1 of chapter 5 where he says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, he's talking to believers. Believers need to be reminded. Believers need to be reminded of this sheer fact. You are loved with a love that is mind-blowing love. A love that is love that, that is just amazing. Paul's subjects are those who have been redeemed. Their hope in Jesus Christ who became their peace or made peace in their lives between them and holy God through his sacrifice upon the cross. This results in joy. God's love results in joy. Or at least it should. And I'll go so far as to this. If, if, if knowing and reading about God's love doesn't do something in your life or doesn't sort of, sort of, sort of move you or, or bring you to a place of gratitude and thankfulness, if it never does, if reading verses 6 through 8 doesn't do something for you or doesn't prompt something in your spirit, I would go so far as to say this. You may not be who you think you are. Because, friends, when I read verses 6 through 8, it it blows my mind to think about how much God loved me. God's love has an effect on us. Two ways. This is not in your notes, so I'll go ahead and tell you. Those who have been touched by God's love are affected in two specific ways. Two ways. First way is this. Those who are touched by God's love want to know more about that God that loves them. And if you don't want to know more about that God, if you're sad, I'm saved, Brother JJ, I'm going to heaven, that's all I need, and I don't need no more. Friends, if that's your attitude, I wonder if you've really met him. Because, friends, I want to tell you something. If I hear about, or if I come to know a man that did what Jesus did for me, I need to try to know and learn as much as I can know about him. You think about it in an earthly sense. If there was somebody that did for you what Jesus has done for you in a spiritual sense, let's just say you were, you were in a place and somebody, somebody come up and they stood between you and death. You and a person that was wanting to take your life. They took a, maybe took a bullet or somebody was going to stab you or do something harmful to you. They came between you and that harmful situation. They lived, you lived, and everybody lived to tell about it. Man, I'm going to tell you what. Some of you, if not all of you, all of us, if somebody did that for us, we wouldn't go around talking, to, talking about him and say, hey, man, let me just tell you about this man. Let's tell you this guy. He didn't have nothing better to do. I was about to die. He helped me out. No big deal. Huh? Man, if somebody did that for you, you'd be going to the paper. You'd be calling everybody you could. Can you believe what this guy did for me? I was about to die and he did that. Friends, why in the world don't we know, want to know more about Jesus? Because he's done just that for us. Those who have been touched by God's love want to know more about that God that has loved them. Second thing that happens to those who have been touched by God. Not only do they want, want to know more about God that has loved them, they want to love others. They want to love others. They want to love and serve others. It is a contradiction. Hear this today. It is a contradiction for a believer in Jesus Christ to live a self-centered life. Let Let me say that one more time. It is a contradiction for a believer in Jesus Christ to live a self-centered life. Let me finally say that one more time because I don't think you get it. It's a contradiction. But we're running around in a world that teaches us to love ourselves more than we love others. We love ourselves more than we love others. Friends, I want to tell you what. There are people that are struggling. There are people that are going through difficulty. But friends, we fostered in our mind this mindset to think, i got to make sure I keep myself safe. i got to make sure I keep myself protected. And in, 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 the, in the mindset of that, you know what we're forgetting to do? The thing we've been called to do, love others. There are people that are struggling in this world today. There are people that are sick and they need help and they need somebody to reach out to them. But we're so concerned about us being safe that we forgot to do what we've been called to do as believers. 
Hey, I know that hurts me too. Amen. But we got to get out of this mindset of selfishness. I got to protect myself so much. Yeah, we need to do what we can. We need to take precautions. We need to be as safe as we can. But hey, let me let you in on a little insight. Living a self-centered life is a contradiction to a child of God. It's a contradiction. Those who have been touched by God's love are people who want to know more about God and want to love others. R.C. Sproul says this, The Bible distinguishes between three different kinds of love in the Bible. There's that uh, eros or an erotic love between a husband and a wife. There's that uh, phileo love, which is a brotherly love. But there's also the agape love, a special kind of love that is a gift of God to his people. It is the agape love here, Sproul says, of which Paul is talking about and referring to here. An ability, a power, and a capacity to love is actually implanted into the heart of those who are truly born again by Jesus Christ. They are called to love others. And it all comes out of that thing. Notice what he says at the latter part of verse 5 there in your text. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts, poured out or poured into our hearts there. This, this word is, a, is, is in a way that we display or imply God's love. Now, now when you hear the word poured, I've had conversations with folks before, and, and it, it comes across, and some people might, might think, well, hey, when you pour something out, you're wasting it. And, and I've done that. I've poured out milk, or I poured out this, or poured this out, and poured it out so much, it came out so fast that it was like I couldn't get it back up, so I, in a sense, wasted it. But when you see this word right here, poured out, it's not talking talking or implying that God wasted his love, not to the contrary. Poured out here, as MacArthur says, refers to lavishing or lavish outpouring to the point of overflowing. Some of you are a little too old to remember this saying. The first service got it. I'm just going to tell you, they got it. Some of you in here, you'll get it. But some of you in here are going to have to help others get it, okay? So y'all just track with me. But friends, what Paul is doing when he uses this word poured out, it's like God's love is so rich and so abundantly coming to us into a cup. It's like when you fill up a cup, it spills out into the saucer. And you drink not just from the cup, but you drink out of the saucer. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You get out there and you drink out of the saucer. That's what it means to be poured out. That's what's been poured in to you and I because of God and his rich love for us. So much so that our our little vessel can't contain it. It's flowing out to others and we're drinking out of the overflow. It's like a waterfall, not a little falls. You think back up there, whenever, whenever there's a dry month or dry time or dry season, we'll get there and we'll see that. We'll see that happening in our lives. My watch just looked up like a little falls. Amen. Praise God. You're smart. But you get up there and it's a dry season. It's a dry time and, and not any water or maybe just a little trickle that's coming out of, of there. But whenever it's rained a lot, you go up there and you'll see that fall. Man, it's just gushing. It's just gushing. It's just rolling and rolling and rolling and just billowing down there. And when it hits the bottom, it's just whoosh, just a beautiful sight. Friends, that's the picture of God's love being poured out into your night, you and me. It's like a river overflowing. Poured out, poured out there. Another powerful point. Notice the condition of the believer when God's love's poured out. Look at verse 6. God's love is poured out through the Holy Spirit given to us. Verse 6, when? When we're just good old good good guys, when we when we're sitting there, we've done all our, our daily Bible reading, when we did this, when we did that, when we've done everything, we've checked all our boxes, is that when God's love's poured out? No. Look at verse 6. For while we were still weak. That word weak is huge. It's big because the word weak here means lacking physical strength and energy, liable to break or give way under pressure, not secure, not stable, unreliable to produce the necessary outcome. The word weak here represents all of humanity in their lost, unregenerate state. It means that you couldn't fix what was wrong in your life. You couldn't even hold yourself up. And it's at that point that God poured his love out into you when you deserved it, not when you couldn't even be good enough to get it. It's when you were his enemy. Charles Hodge says this, beautiful, beautiful point. Listen to this. If God's love for us, if God loved us because we loved him, he would love us only so long as we loved him. 
and out of that condition. And then our salvation would be dependent on the consistency of our treacherous hearts. But as God loved us as a sinner, God hasn't loved us on the basis of us loving him. He loved us when we were unlovable. Thus telling us that we are held and kept not by ourselves, but by the power of God Almighty. This is where we get the doctrine of perseverance of the saints. This is where we get that, that foundational doctrine to the Christian faith that we are kept not by our ability to love, not by our ability to do right, do wrong, but kept by the power of God that is perfect in everything. Because you know what? It started when we didn't love Him. And it continues whether our lives change or ebb and flow. God, as Brother Todd said a moment ago, God's love for us is constant. And brothers, brothers and sisters, if that don't bring you joy, then you don't know him. God did not. God did not wait until we had performed well enough to merit his love. God loved us. Watch this, verse 6. Another good word right here in verse 6. While we were still weak, God loved us when? At the right time. At the right time. Think about when you came to meet Jesus Christ. Friends, think about it. I think back to my life. It was right at the right time because at that moment I thought if I didn't trust Jesus right then, if I didn't surrender my life to Jesus, there wasn't going to be another opportunity. At the right time, God pours his love into our life. Sproul explains the right time this way. In English, there is a distinction between events that are historical and those that are historic. Now listen, listen to this. There's differences between events that are historical and those that are historic. Not every event that happens in history is historic. Although everything that happens in history is historical, everything that is historic, in a sense, has a lasting impression and a radiant significance because of what flows before and what follows after. Friends, when we talk about God's love being poured out to us, Jesus Christ coming to earth in the form of a, a human being, being born in the likeness of men so that he could die the death we deserved and we could live the life that we didn't deserve. Friends, when we talk about that, that has forever changed history. We will call that and deem that, according to Sproul's definition, a historic event because it has forever changed. And you know why it's historic? And you know why it's forever changed? Because everybody's trying to disprove it. And you know what you can't do? You can't disprove it because it really happened. A sinner is a transgressor of the law. And so we can say that while we were being saved, uh, while we were actively disobedient to God, while we were in a state of rebellion against God, while we were hostile to God, at the right time, God moved in our life. And know what he did? Look at verse 8. But God shows, shows his love for us. And friends, I'm going to tell you what, you're gonna, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and give you an insight. I'm going to go ahead and give you a little, a little prequel. A little, I'm going to give you a little urging. This is a good amen moment. Y'all with me? Listen, listen. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. Y'all got it. Praise God. Hallelujah. The word shows there is amazing. The word shows is amazing. Maybe your translation says demonstrated. It has the same implication. The word there is in the present active tense form of the word, meaning that the action taking place and the action happening was an action that happened in the past, but that action that happened in the past has continuing effect in the present. God showed his love in the past in sending Jesus and allowing him to go through the agony of the cross and demonstrating his love and publicly showing that. That was an event that happened in the past, but yet that event that happened in the past is still having powerful moments and effects on people's lives today. It's in the indicative form as well. And I know you English folks will love this. That means it's real and true. It was an event that really took place. Brothers and sisters today, take comfort, take hope, be encouraged, rejoice in this. God loved you when you were unlovable and you can celebrate this fact. He still loves you today. God's love brings joy. 
Second thing Paul reminds us of, not only does God's love bring joy, but, but, but Paul reminds us that certain deliverance from God's wrath brings joy. Amen? Y'all missed it. I thought y'all were with me. God's love brings deliverance from joy. Look at verse 9, verse 10. Amazing. Since, that word since, therefore, connects right back to verses 6 and six through 8. What Jesus, or what Paul, Jesus in the power of the Spirit, through Paul's pen, tells us uh, has happened. Christ died for us, the, the, the godly for the ungodly. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by his death, by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Again, these two verses, like, like, like other places, talk about or emphasize the importance of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Without the resurrection of Jesus, Jesus was no different than anyone else. However, because of the resurrection, Jesus is distinct and different than anybody else. Jesus here, because of his resurrection and because of what we read and what we understand from the power of the Spirit, the phrase, look at this phrase, much more, that we find right here in verse 9. Since, therefore, we have been uh, justified by his blood much more. If it wasn't good enough to be saved, to be sanctified, to be delivered, there's another bonus, another blessing that should bring you joy. There's a wrath that is building up, Romans chapter 2 tells us. There's a wrath that is building up. Man is building wrath up for himself, against himself, and will be revealed and unleashed at the day, at the judgment of God, when God comes back, unless they repent, unless they trust in Christ. That wrath that has been stored up because of disobedience is one day going to be unleashed on mankind but child of God take comfort take hope in this though the world may give way though everything around you may seem to be falling apart if you're a child of God saved sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ much more here's a blessing to you you're not going to have to face that you're not going to have to go through that wrath you're not going to have to experience that wrath that's going to come out. That's why, this is another reason why I believe that the church will be raptured out before the tribulation happens. We're not going to see the wrath of God unleashed on that. Maybe from the grandstands, if you will, of heaven, although I don't know why we would look at that when we had Jesus to look at. But we're not, I don't believe that. Much more. This is amazing blessing in the hearts of children and the children of God because of Jesus Christ and because of how much He has loved us. You have inherited you had inherited sin and you were born into it, deserving of death, deserving of wrath. But thanks be unto God who gave us Jesus Christ, and because of Jesus Christ, we inherit what we don't what we do we inherit what we don't deserve because we don't get what we do deserve. We inherit sanctification. We have certain, certain deliverance. And friends, that should bring you joy. Finally, finally, third thing we see. The culmination of it all, Paul reminds us that reconciliation, reconciliation on behalf of Christ brings joy to the believer in Jesus Christ. Look at verse 11. More than that. More than that, Paul. Is there more? Oh, yeah, there's more than that. More than that, Paul. What are you talking about? We also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now been reconciled. The word reconciled means brought back into a right relationship with God. Why? MacArthur says, why do we exalt in God through our Lord Jesus Christ who gave us access to him? Why? Because from him we received the gift of reconciliation. He gave us a gift in giving us Jesus Christ. He gave you a gift. He gave you a gift that is always the right size. Amen? Many of y'all are going to get gifts this year. I know. I know you've been working out. You've been working hard. But I want to just tell you, some of you are going to get some gifts and they're going to fit you. Amen? No matter how much you try to make them fit. Don't look at me like that. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I can squeeze it to a medium when I'm really an XL. You know what I'm saying? 
because I want to show you I've been working out. Sometimes we get things that don't fit. But let me tell you about the beautiful thing about Jesus Christ. He fits everybody. He fits everywhere. If you get bigger, you know what? He gets bigger with you. He, he's the ultimate stretchy pants. Amen? I don't mean to demean Jesus into that. I'm, I'm just, that's just what comes to my mind. Amen? And you know what? Second service, Angela don't like it, but I get a little looser. Amen? But he, he, does, he goes with us. Whatever happens in our life, he's right there loving us. And it's like the psalmist said, every morning there's grace made for this day. He goes with us. He's right there with us. It doesn't matter. He is the ultimate gift for mankind. He never goes out of style. He never goes out of fashion. He is always there because you know what? It doesn't matter what you go through. He is always relevant. You know, there's a lot of people that are saying, you know what, you can't, you can't preach the Bible today because you're not relevant. You're not going to get people. You're not going to gain people. You're not going to gain people's attention. You can't stand up there and preach the Word of God to people because they're just not going to get it. They're not going to sit there and listen to that and listen to that and listen to that about this archaic thing. I'm going to tell you what, the Bible says of itself, it is a living, active sword that cuts deep to the marrow. I'm going to tell you what, I'm going to default to the Word of God rather than being hip and cool. Amen? Because you know what, hip and cool left me a long time ago. Amen? I, I, I can't care about that no more. As much as I want to be hip and cool, my body won't let me be hip and cool. Amen? You know what, though? All joking aside, all we need is Jesus. All we need is the Word of God. Because it's from the Word of God that we learn about this powerful gift of reconciliation. The ultimate joy, here's how I explain Reconciliation. Best way I know how to explain it in an earthly scenario. Think with me just for a moment. Now, I know it's going to be hard for y'all because y'all are good folks. But think with me just for a moment. Suppose you committed a crime. And you committed a crime so bad that the effects or the outcome or the, the, the end result of that crime being committed puts you on trial and you were put on trial for possible life in prison without parole or even death. You're on trial. People come in and they present their case and the case is it, just it's overwhelming evidence points to you as being the one that is guilty of what you were said of doing. No way. You can bring witness after witness after witness, but every time a witness comes, it just further corroborates and further substantiates the case against you that you are guilty. And you're sitting there saying, oh my goodness, there's no, no, nothing that I can do to get out of this lot. There's no amount of good. I can't do community service. I can't do this. I can't do that. I am about to be sentenced to either life in prison or death. All the case comes to the end, comes all the way down to the end, and everybody's there on judgment day. The sentence is about to be read. The paper is passed to the judge, and sentence is about to be announced and carried out. The judge reads the sentence, and it's as worse or as bad as you could possibly imagine. No life in prison. They say the, the, the evidence was so overwhelming against you that you are going to be sentenced to death. Carried out immediately. No chance for appeal. The case is that strong against you. The judge reads the findings, reads the ruling, and the judge is about to do what judges usually do before they dismiss a court case. They are about to let the gavel fall, dismissing and closing and solidifying everything that she has just read. And as the gavel raises right before it hits, there's a voice in the back of the courtroom, Stop! Stop! And everybody's aghast. What's going on? What's going on? The case is over. The sentence has been read. What in the world is going on? What is going on? And, and as you're standing there, you look back at that person that yelled stop and you don't even recognize who they are. You don't even know them from, from anyone. You have never really seen them. But as they get closer and closer, you begin to, to, to realize that, that though you don't know them personally, you've heard about them all your life. And that person comes closer and closer to you. And as they come into focus, you realize this is Jesus Christ. 
The proceedings have stopped. You are guilty. Sentence told that you deserve death, immediate death. However, Jesus, whom you've never met, never really known about, only heard about, comes in here, stands before the judge that was about to lower the gavel solidifying the judgment on you and you're about to be taken away and all of a sudden Jesus looks up at that judge and says don't kill him I'll take his sentence let that sink in just a minute sentence had been pronounced judgment was about to be carried out but Jesus stepped in let me go back and read something to you for while we were still weak at the right time hello at the right time Jesus steps in and he says I'll take the sentence they take Jesus and they kill Jesus in your place and because he is willing to be a substitute for you you now have been reconciled and restored back into society as if you never did anything wrong. Friends, that's how much God loves you and me. And not only how much he loves you, that's how much he demonstrated it for you and me. It was a, 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 a event that happened long ago, but still has lasting effects today. Now, I know that's not a real situation, real life, but that's what happened in the person called Jesus Christ. You and I deserve much worse, much worse, much worse than an earthly judgment. And friends, let me just tell you what, COVID-19 is bad. It is terrible. It is wreaking havoc on families, and it is terrible. But I'm just going to tell you as kindly as I can and compassionately as I can, COVID-19 is nothing compared to the wrath of holy God that is going to be unleashed on sinful mankind one day. And the only chance we have is not a vaccine, but a Savior called Jesus Christ. And you know what the good news is? He loves you so much, He was willing to take everything you deserve so that you could gain everything you didn't deserve. Hallelujah, what a Savior. If that don't bring you joy, you haven't met that man called Jesus. We close this up, Brother, Brother Blake. We come to a close. Ask yourself this question. Today, I, I, I ask you, ask yourself this question. Have I, have I, and you put your name in I, have I received the blessing of joy from the Lord? Have I received the blessing? What is the blessing of joy, Brother JJ? Reconciliation. Do you know today if you are a believer? Beyond a shadow of a doubt, do you know it? Beyond a shadow of a doubt. If today was the day, and let me just be real with you. We don't know when that day is. But if today was the day you dropped, where would you wake up? Because the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But if we're, if we're present with the Lord, those that don't know the Lord are going to be present somewhere else. Today was the day. And our lives were gone. Have you received the blessing of joy from the Lord called reconciliation? Maybe you answer that question and say, yes, I have. Yes, I am a believer. Yes, I have been saved. Then let me ask you the second question. Are you demonstrating that joy to others? How do I do that, Brother JJ? Very simply. You've heard this acronym, Jesus, others, and yourself. I want to do a little twist on it. Here's how I believe you can demonstrate joy of your reconciliation to others everywhere you go no matter what situation you find yourself in make sure that when people see you they don't see you as much as they see Jesus in you amen Jesus. People need to see Jesus in us. If there's ever been a time in the history of this world where people need to see joy, they need to see it in the children of God and in the church of the living God. They need to see Jesus in us because when they see Jesus in us, it equates to joy. Are you demonstrating Jesus? How do I do that, Brother JJ? I sacrificially give to others when they're in need. I give. I demonstrate the way Jesus demonstrated for me. I, I love people with an agape love. 
that means that I may not get love back, but it doesn't matter as long as I'm loving them like Jesus loved them. Show your love for Jesus by putting him first in all things. Secondly, the O. Show your love for others by serving someone in some way. There's something you can do for someone today. I guarantee you, you look around. If you look long enough, if you look hard enough, and you don't have to look long and hard, you'll find somebody that's in need, and you need to share Jesus with them. Serve somebody else. That's how you can be joyous this season. It's more blessed, as the Bible says, to give than to receive. And then finally... You've heard it said, pray for yourself, or then you, your last. I say this, pray that you will always put the other two things first. And the reason I say that, don't ever think about yourself. Don't think about putting yourself front. Don't think about doing this or doing that. And the reason I say that is not because I don't love you or not because I don't think God loves you. But what I think is this. If we get these first two right, if we put Jesus first and put others first, then inevitably what's going to happen with you is somebody else who's doing the same thing is going to come right full circle and take care of you. So you're not going to have to worry about yourself. If we're serving the way we ought to serve, but you know what's happened in the world today? We've not become other-centered. We've become self-centered. And we're just looking out for number one. Remember what I said a moment ago? Self-centeredness, selfishness is uncharacteristic of a child of God. Show Jesus to others. Put others out there. Serve them. And then pray for yourself that you will do the first two, Jesus and others. Jesus and others. Jesus and others. You know why? Because these are the greatest two commandments Jesus said. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. You do these, you fulfill what God has called you to do. Friends, God's loved you, watch this, so that you can love us. And might I just add this little closing remark, and I'm done. Could it be that you're joyless because you're not putting Jesus first and others second? Could it be that you're trying to find joy in and of yourself and in and around yourself because you're trying to live selfishly rather than purposely for Jesus Christ? I believe there's a lot to be thought about there. So I invite you, bow your heads and close your eyes this morning. Number one, do you know Jesus? Have you received the joy of Jesus through being reconciled by him to God. If not, then here's your, here's what you need to do. You need to cry out to him. And say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Forgive me of my sins. I confess them to you. Come into my heart. Save me. Change me. Make me who you want me to be rather than who I want me to be. And on the authority of God's word, if you confess him as Lord, the Bible says you'll be saved. That's your first step. But believer... I encourage you, there can be joy in joyless surroundings. There can be, there can be joy in troublesome times, but it only happens when our focus is not on our subjects, but rather than on the object of Jesus Christ. Where's your focus today? If it's not on Jesus, there's not going to be joy. If you need to come, recommit, rededicate, or pray that God will use you as a joy bearer for someone's life, or maybe just come and thank God for his gift called Jesus Christ and how much he loved you. Whatever you deem the Spirit is leading you to do, you do today in this moment. Father, thank you for this day. I pray you speak to our hearts. Draw us close to you. And may you do your work in our midst right now. In Jesus' name. With your heads bowed and eyes closed, I invite you to stand to your feet. Brother Blake's going to play a verse and a chorus. And in that time, if you need to respond, the altar's open. You mind the Spirit of the Lord. Then came the morning Jesus has loved you. Think about what all went into that.
thank you this morning that you are our living hope. You conquered death, hell in the grave, and not only did you conquer it, you made a way for us to be made your children. Father, thank you today for your love, your mercy. Father, thank you for the certainty of our deliverance. Thank you for the gift of reconciliation. Father, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians, that gift has been given to us not to hoard to ourselves, but to share with others. May we be taking that reconciliation to the world and being involved in reconciling others for you. Lord, we love you. Thank you for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing that chorus again, Brother Blake, as a testimony to our Lord. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ. great day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let me just remind you of a couple of things real quickly for us today. As I said earlier, uh, the funeral for Brother Don Miss Helen will be at Good Hope 2 o'clock, graveside. Uh, so make plans if you want to be there. Or as we said, if you can't be there, pray. Pray for the family and pray for those involved in that today. Also, today is our collection day. We've set aside for Lottie Moon Christmas offering. So uh, if you're prepared, that's great. If you're not, uh, you can still give throughout the remainder of the month. But this was just the day we set aside to do that uh, collection day. So uh, you pray as God has uh, pray, uh, prayerfully led you. Because your gift helps uh, share the gospel with those around the world. It helps get Jesus' name known throughout the world. So that's what your gift is doing. Uh, through the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Amen. Any other announcements that we need to be made aware of before we go? Amen. I'm going to ask Brother Steve, great house, uh, uh, would you pray for us as we are dismissed? We'll say goodbye to our folks on TV. Hope you have a great week. God bless you.